to Elder Primacy from Free Float Media, a podcast about activist investing, securities law, and all the ways the financial and legal worlds intersect and collide in real life. I'm here with Ann Lipton, a law professor at Tulane in New Orleans who teaches and researches securities and business law. She, of course, holds up the legal end of our podcast. And that's Mike Levin, an activist investor who lives and works in Chicago. He covers the financial side of our podcast. Yes, thank you. We have some interesting things we can talk about uh, related to uh, climate change disclosure rules that are that the SEC is in charge of and kind of what's happening there. So uh, we can do a really fun deep dive onto that. Yeah, and we should also look at this interesting activist attack at Pfizer. Yes, F- Pfizer uh, and starboard value. We'll handle that a little later. But let's first... Talk about the climate change rules or disclosure rules. Um, I will confess uh, I uh, have not followed that too closely. I imagine there's a bunch of other listeners that have varying degrees of familiarity with that. So we may have to start from the beginning. Uh, So, Mm -hmm. uh, Anne, uh, what do these rules involve? (laughs) Okay, so taking the giant step back. As you know, the SEC requires that publicly traded companies make regular disclosures about their business. And those things. 10K, 8K. Yes, exactly. Annual reports, quarterly reports. All that stuff, proxy stuff, lots of disclosure. That's the whole, that's the centerpiece of, 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 between registration and disclosure. That's, that's how we regulate companies, right? Right. Well, that's one way we do it. Oh, and, fine. All right. um, Go ahead. <laughs> and these disclosures, um, they include balance sheets, income statements, all that kind of hard financial data, but also more qualitative information like risks the company faces, trends that might impact operations. So back in 2010, uh, people were agitating for more information on how climate change was affecting businesses. And the SEC it didn't in- change any of its rules, but it did put out this guidance. And the guidance was there to remind companies that the pre-existing requirements that company disclose risks and trends could include factors pertaining to climate change. And so they should consider whether climate change is presenting risks and trends that should be disclosed alongside their other risks. Fast right. forward to 2022. The SEC concluded that this 2010 guidance wasn't good enough. The information being generated wasn't particularly detailed. It wasn't comparable across companies. So now the SEC proposed specific rules requiring that companies disclose how climate change is impacting operations. There was an absolute tsunami of commentary. And the SEC issued final rules earlier this year. And I'll briefly just summarize what those were. Let me me stop for a second, make sure at least I understand and everyone else. So originally... The idea of disclosing disclosing stuff, information about a company's climate policy, climate disclosures, whatever, was considered kind of part of very generalized disclosure. Exactly, it was part of rules. this generalized, loose disclosed trends. Guys disclose all sorts operations. of stuff, and then, and then and then there were you said people. There were various parties that yeah. found that unsatisfactory. Who were exactly. some of those parties? Well, some generally? of them would be investors. Some of them would be more activists who who you know sure. are advocates for social responsibility. Investors who are both you know that kind of mix. Got it. So so they found that. Kind of disclosure unsatisfactory, so yeah, they but pressured and the SEC. Up, yeah, including yeah. straight up financial investors, like a mix. You know, all the sure. all the right. all the players. Right, and um, they found, and so they pressured the SEC to to be more specific. Exactly, and they've okay. been doing. I mean, for for a while, and obviously in the Biden administration, for for the Biden administration, climate change was a big thing. So the SEC began to seriously focus on developing more specific rules. Uh, and that was around twenty twenty two. That was 2022 was when they proposed them. The oh, final okay, ones came out early this year. Okay. Um, and, and so and what, what happened? <laughs> so, well, these rules, this is what they, they require. The final rules, um, I'm just summarizing. Companies yeah, have okay. to annually disclose their losses and expenditures caused by severe weather events. They have to disclose whether the assumptions used in formulating their financial statements account for severe weather events. They have to describe climate risks that are likely to materially impact operations. And they have to have a host of related information like mitigating steps, transition plans, how business strategy is impacted. They have to describe how the board and management oversee climate risks. And that includes They have to disclose if there are board committees that consider climate risk, which management personnel is involved, what their expertise is, that kind of thing. They have to explain their processes for identifying climate risks and managing them. And then for larger companies, 
only larger companies, they have to disclose certain greenhouse gas emissions, but only if that information is deemed material to investors. And there are rules about assurance, making sure the numbers are truthful. So, That's so the there seems idea. to be two halves. First is how climate risks generally written affect the company. And then for certain other large filers, how they're dealing, how they're affecting the climate, I guess. Well, sort of. They're GHG admissions. So exactly. This right. part of that rule is very um, controversial because it reads much more like we're trying to control your environmental effect on the world. The justification is essentially that these companies may be exposed to transition risk, meaning that if they're in jurisdictions that have new regulations that require they reduce right. GHG emissions, then that's going to affect them. But they only have to disclose that if that's material. Um, okay. So that's the general idea. And these rules drew a bunch of challenges. Um, you can petition an appeals court to vacate new regulations. So that's exactly what happened. There were nine different cases filed. Wow. All of the petitions were consolidated into one big case that's now pending in the Eighth Circuit. So the Eighth Circuit will hear this challenge and decide whether the rules can go into effect. And this is the whole list, every, all all, this whole set of rules is now being challenged. And who challenged it? Probably well, okay. the business roundtablers. I don't yeah, know. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Everybody challenged it. So the challengers include several nonprofits and trade associations like the business, like the U.S. Chamber, the Texas Alliance of Energy Producers, the National Center for Public Policy Research, plus yep. 25 states are challenging. The usual oh, wow. suspects, red states, Louisiana, yeah. Texas, uh, Iowa, Missouri, West Virginia, on the other side, then, defending the rule is the SEC, obviously, but 18 states plus the District of Columbia intervened to also defend the rule. So they're defending it. And those are just the parties. Then there are the amicus briefs. There are a zillion amicus briefs from yeah, other groups, sure. including the Business Roundtable. I can't even count the number of Business Roundtable, bunch of nonprofits and trade associations, academics, former SEC officials, current members of Congress, and so three more states. So there's dozens of these to read. There yeah, are right. so many. <laughs> three, and they're very repetitive, incidentally. They don't all, you know, they don't all say different things. Right. There are okay, three I'll, more I'll let, states. I'll let you do the reading and tell us about it. How's that there, sound? I think that sounds <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> Three additional states who also weighed in as amicus instead of intervening formally, which sure. means, by the way, that there are exactly four states that have not taken a position okay, on these Okay, which four? Rules. I have to ask. Maine, New Jersey, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Those are the only states that have not Listen, weighed in. Just say, we're just not, we're not, we got better things to do. They, yes, <laughs> but everybody else has taken one side or the other. Um, right. So I'm sure in the past there have been other cases that have drawn this much briefing, but not that many of them. Okay, fine. So, and this is in uh, Eighth Circuit? This district? is all pending in the Eighth Circuit, yes. Which, where's that again? <laughs> Don't make me. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Off the top of my okay. head, I'll get it wrong. Okay, so it's, but it's in federal district court right now. No, appellate court. It's in the, it's oh, in the federal appellate court. court. Oh, so it's yes. already been kicked up to an appellate no, court. Yeah, because these challenges are filed directly in the appellate court. Oh, that was my question. Is yes. kind of what level. So the next yes. move after this is Supreme Court. We'll see exactly. Anyway, great. So- what are the sub? So what are they arguing against? I mean, it, it sounds like I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, people generally like disclosure. These seem to be pretty. <laughs> what's the, the ones who have to make them? Why what, What's the what's the okay. opposition? But you can. Well, I mean, politically, we can guess what the opposition. Yes. But the arguments, the legal arguments, you could break down into two buckets: the substantive and procedural. The substantive arguments are that these rules are wholly unlike anything the SEC has ever done before, and therefore categorically beyond the commission's power. So these arguments include claims like they're not really investor rules, they're environmental rules, they're intended oh, to advance an environmental agenda. The SEC has no expertise to advance an environmental agenda. Congress didn't authorize the SEC to become an environmental regular re regulator, right. that the rules violate the First Amendment because they're oh, so okay. outside the SEC's normal business, that kind of thing. So those are the substantive arguments. These are just sort of categorically different from anything the SEC has ever required disclosure about. The procedural arguments are that even if the SEC is authorized to adopt rules like this, they didn't do it the right way. They didn't have enough evidence that a rule like this is needed. They sure. didn't proper evaluate the costs. The final rule was too different from the proposed rule, that kind of thing. So there were these procedural, exactly. which is pretty routine to object on, yeah, on I mean, sometimes grounds, they kind of melt together. Like, you know, there's some argument that, like, the procedures were so bad that you can only conclude that the SEC wasn't acting within the scope of its authority, that kind of thing. But it's basically, you know, either this is just no rules like this have ever been permitted under the securities laws, or maybe they could be, but only in a world where the SEC dotted more T's and crossed more I's. Okay, fine. And then, and then of course, all the substantive ones are pretty significant, which sound like they revolve around the SEC is not the EPA. 
Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's said right. repeatedly. <laughs> okay, cool. Now, um, I have to ask, what's, um, <laughs> what's your view of the arguments on sort of pro and con here? Okay, well, I mean, when we're talking about the substantive And you challenges. probably have a, an opinion. I, I, I do I have mean, an opinion. Do you, let me ask, do you have an opinion about these rules? I do have an opinion about these okay, rules, yes. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's, let's hear that. Well, let me talk about the argument. So I think a lot <laughs> of the challenges um, distort what the rules actually do. Um, other than the requirement that the GHG admissions been disclosed, which we mentioned, and that's only for larger companies and only if right. their emissions are material, these rules are not about getting companies to become more environmentally friendly or whatever. These are about accounting for the fact that property in Louisiana, Florida, and California is uninsurable, about the fact that workers are suffering from heat exhaustion because they can't right. tolerate outdoor climates, about bridges getting stuck because they're warped by heat so you can't ship goods, planes right. can't take off in Arizona yeah, okay. because the temperatures are too high. So, so, so all the stuff we're reading about, your companies are now going going to be required to kind of disclose the impact and, and, of and that it says, and it's to the investors. Impact and and, and yeah. come up with the plan. So that's what the vast majority of these rules are aimed at. And I find it ludicrous to say this isn't a financial concern or an investment concern. We know there's a huge industry right now in climate intelligence. Citadel hired weather forecasters yes. to assist in its commodities training. So right. um, the whole purpose of the securities laws is to make that information public so that individual investors don't have to engage in duplicative efforts to ferret it out. And once you're there, if you recognize that these are not environmental rules, these are really about infrastructure risks posed by climate change, it's very hard to say that they're categorically different from any other disclosure requirement that the SEC has adopted in the last hundred years. So, so, the, so, so basically, in, in part, this becomes a an argument in the legal sense, legal argument about um, materiality that well, these have be, these have become material now. And yeah, they, and I they mean, require well, disclosure. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah. So, I mean, just to be clear on this, that, you know, some of the arguments are simply that this is so, like, environmental is so far outside what the SEC normally does. You, we, you know, you're supposed to do balance sheets and income statements. And the difficulty with that kind of requirement is that the SEC has always disclosed things that go beyond balance sheets and income statements. So there There's are the other 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 a a analogs. Exactly. To this. There's okay, exactly. Go ahead. They already have to disclose we mentioned risks and trends that impact operations. Recently the SEC required companies to disclose the board's role in overseeing cybersecurity risk, sure. including the personnel responsible for cybersecurity and their qualifications. Companies have to disclose their human capital resources and their policies for developing and retaining personnel. They have to disclose the board's role in overseeing corporate risk taking, how that affects the board's leadership structure. They have to disclose how their compensation policies align with their risk management policies. Yeah. And in 2010, the SEC said existing rules required climate disclosures, and no one suggested it was beyond the SEC's authority. So if you can require companies to disclose climate change risks as part of sort of generalized risk, there's right. no reason why they can't just then say, well, you know what, that's actually not effective because different companies interpret the rule differently. There's no standardization. Therefore, we're going to have a more detailed list of requirements to make sure everyone's looking at this the same way. And that's another benefit of having a uniform securities disclosure system, standardization. You can disagree right. with the policy choice, but it's really hard to see why that should be categorically outside the SEC's power. And, and, and as someone who reads this stuff all the time, I could, there are some companies in my portfolio or others I research, research where I am probably less interested in their climate, impact of climate on their business. Like, you know, I'm really not that interested in how climate's going to affect a publicly traded ad agency mm -hmm. or somebody like that. There, there, there's some where it, it, it would be a stretch for that company to try to come up with credible, reasonably precise estimates. I mean, it. Sure, I'm, I'm glad they're 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 thinking about it a little bit, but it's not actually going to be. There are plenty of other companies where I am. Wondering, I wonder about the impact of climate events, as you said, as or as the reg says, I think, yeah. um, on the company. Plenty of people in the oil and gas, obviously oil and gas business, but there's another end of that that, you know, that may affect them in other ways, too. But there are, you know, real REITs, I don't know, you know, there's tons of right. companies where climate. And so so just having the opportunity to understand this a little bit could could be helpful. It may yeah. not necessarily be helpful right yeah. now, exactly. but at least getting in the habit of disclosing this stuff of, and of get, establishing a yeah. baseline. Yeah, exactly. And if the company doesn't have any risks to report, doesn't have any risks to report. So 
but a lot of the challengers are claiming that the information um, is immaterial, as you said. And this is yeah. like, I just want to explain what this argument is because I think it's, well, funny, but it's a technical point, but it's important for how the security laws operate. As you say, we assume investors don't care about every single fact. They only care about material facts or important right. facts. And technically, legally, the standard is sort of a fuzzy standard. It's um, facts likely to be significant to reasonable right. investors. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty. It's, a, cir it's a circular definition last yeah, time yeah. I it's, remember it's an looking at it. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of an imprecise <laughs> standard. So some of these new climate rules specifically say you only have to disclose something if it's material. And some of the rules, if you read them, they say, you know, disclose this if it's material. And some say disclose it no matter what. So, for example, you have to disclose all losses due to weather events subject to a bright line de, de minimis exception. As long as it's sure. above the threshold, you have to disclose it. The company doesn't get to decide some weather event losses were immaterial. If it's above the dollar threshold, it has to be disclosed. And some of the challengers basically essentially claim that this means the SEC is requiring immaterial information. And that's proof that these aren't really investor oriented rules. But to, I, you have to understand how the securities laws work. So the securities laws have this long list of items companies have to disclose. And sometimes those rules say only disclose if material. And sometimes they don't. You just have to disclose it. Boards have to disclose their role in overseeing corporate risk. The rule doesn't say disclose the board's role in overseeing corporate risk if it's material. You just have to disclose it. Right. It, because, it's it's right, like a general because, right. If there's a materiality qualifier, like saying if it's material, that might protect um, against burying inv investors and in trivial information. But when there's a materiality qualifier, it's harder for companies to know what their obligations are. It's harder for the SEC to administer the rule. And you create these idiosyncrasies and in interpretation from company to company. So the SEC, in its judgment, sometimes says, you know what? I think this topic is generally important enough that everybody should disclose it. And if it turns out there's not much to disclose, fine. No big deal. And, you and, just, and you'll say that. And you'll say, and you'll look, say that. We've, we've studied this. We, ha we, we, have no risk. we followed a process. We've hired a consultant, whatever we've needed to do. Exactly. And in our opinion, that risk is low. And then it'll be up to the auditor, it, the external auditor who looks at uh, controls to, to figure yeah, out whether so that was it, a sensible. That exactly. Was right. Okay. And that's exactly. So some of these climate change rules have no materiality qualifier and some have them. So. Um, and, and But ironically, some challengers even take issue with the rules that do have a materiality qualifier, the ones that say you only have to disclose it if it's material, oh, right. for because sure. for a company to even make the determination of materiality, they have to examine the issue, and that's expensive. And so the challengers object to the rules right. when they don't have a materiality qualifier, and they object to the rules when they do have a materiality okay, so qualifier. They, they just don't like the rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the reality is that the language of the climate rules reads like it was modeled on the other rules. Like some of the language is very similar to the size cybersecurity rule. It's very similar to the MDNA rules about trends that are reasonably likely to impact. So I do think, though, that there is a theme here. And this is the theme to the rules. The right. SEC believes that climate change will have a significant financial impact on business. A lot of assets are going to be damaged. Supply chains are going to be interrupted. Companies are going to have to build redundancies into their systems, whatever else. And the SEC also believes, I think, this is what you get from the rules, that companies aren't currently accounting for that. And so those future costs are not being accurately represented to investors. And the SEC wants to change that by forcing companies to focus on the issue. So the challengers are right, I think, on this point. Many parts of the rules are not really disclosure rules at all. These are governance rules. So, for example, when the SEC says, describe how the board and management oversee climate risks. That's sure, a governance a point. Right, that's, right. I mean, the company could say, yeah, actually, no one on our board and management is paying attention to climate risk, but they're not going to say that. So now the company yeah. has to create a management team to look at climate risk when maybe it didn't have one before. So that's really a governance rule. But it's not any different from any other aspect of the securities laws. Sure, so it's like cybersecurity. Security does There's the exact the same thing. Right, exactly, right. All of the disclosure rules, the trend disclosures, the financial disclosures, all require boards to develop corporate processes to collect and evaluate information so it can be disclosed. And that's always been how the securities laws operate. You can go back to 33 and read the debate surrounding the securities laws. Congress was very explicit that disclosure would have the effect of improving corporate governance. One legislator said, yes, the bill is intended to interfere with business. Business. Felix right. Frankfurter said disclosure would force new business habits. So my big worry here, this is my real big concern, is that if the Eighth Circuit or eventually the Supreme Court accepts the argument that there's something categorically different about the climate change rules, we're then on this slippery slope. Oh, it'll it'll reflect back on all these other all subjects. these other rules. It's not because it's not 1933, and we've really come a very long way from acquiring like balance sheets and income statements. We required more right. than that in 1933. So that leaves us with the procedural argument. 
the SEC didn't do its homework. And all I can say about that is the SEC studied this for years. They processed hundreds of comments and formulated this rule that whatever else you think of it requires companies to acknowledge the financial risks facing business in a changing climate. Is there counter evidence? Sure. Are there reasons to think it's not the bestest rule the SEC could have come up with? Sure. Will it cost companies money to comply? Oh, sure. But all right. of that is true no matter what the SEC does. And if the mere fact that there's disagreement and judgment involved is a reason to strike the rule down, then courts are just now being super regulators. They aren't leaving right. that task to the agency anymore. They're just taking that power to themselves. And quite frankly, I trust the SEC more than I trust the Eighth Circuit. I, 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 yes, I would, I would guess based on recent jurisprudence that there's yeah. this <laughs> trend, which we don't have to talk about today, yeah. uh, toward trying to uh, lessen the impact of, but anyway. Um, so it sounds like you're, um, if if you were on the Eighth Circuit, you would. What would you What would you be doing? I, I think I know, but I just want to ask. Yeah, no, I'm in favor of the rules. I mean, in a, in the broad sense, I, I don't really have a position on whether these particular rules are the bestest rules, or if I was drafting them, I would have written them this way. But my view is. The highest purpose of the securities laws, the meta reason we have securities regulation, is to ensure efficient capital allocation. We yeah. want to make sure that our resources flow to good, profitable, productive businesses, and they don't flow to businesses that are going to evaporate. If capital flows, say, to a tourist town that's going to be completely destroyed by a hurricane in 10 years, that's more than just a loss of investor money. No, that's a loss right. to everyone who moved to the town and got a job there and bought a home right. there and raised kids there. When the town's underwater, even if the residents survive, they're going to have to relocate and start their lives over. That's socially yes. wasteful. So really, I think on a meta level, securities laws are supposed to prevent that. They're supposed to give investors sufficient information so that they don't direct investment to socially right. wasteful exactly. businesses. It's, it's, it's a capital allocation. Exactly. So we aid. don't want investment yeah. to go to that town. We want it to flow to some other town that's going to still be around. And that's what these rules are about. Making sure that when capital allocation decisions are made, they're made with a view to which assets are going to survive and which aren't. But I'll also say... For me personally, yeah. we yeah. know oh, there's well, a lot I, where of, you where you live. That, well, where I live, I mean, in New Orleans. Right. But <laughs> I, 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 I hate having to watch for hurricanes every summer. But also there's a lot of political opposition to climate change adaptation measures. We know that there's these blues political fights. And my own view is that if businesses are forced to truly reckon with what the costs are going to be, then maybe some of that resistance will loosen up. And I think that would be a very good thing in terms of, you know, like spurring the political establishment to move faster with adaptation. Right. And, and, and to and to help in the future assure that the SEC doesn't have to be the EPA, that yeah, exactly. the EPA can, in fact, do its own thing. Yeah. Is that is that? Well, I don't think these are EPA style rules, but yeah, no, I think I that we could see we could still see that, you know, more measures to shore up, you know, existing infrastructure and so forth, more more reason to make those regulations if businesses have to sort of reckon with the kind of cost they're facing. Cool. Wow. Well, that was uh, th there's a lot to think about. And we'll probably return to this. It sounds like the well, Eighth yeah, Circuit's going to make a ruling I mean, yeah. and we'll hear what they have exactly. to say. When's, it, when's that going to happen? Do we we know? don't know. We don't even have an oral argument scheduled. But at some oh, point, okay. there's going to be an oral argument. And then, of course, whatever happens, it goes to the Supreme Court. I'm sure it'll get appealed up and we'll see if the, yes, the Supreme Court probably, they may want to take this. I don't oh, know. They, they will take it. I promise. Oh, they will? Oh, that's <laughs> absolutely. Oh, OK. Well, you've, you you clerked there. You know what they yeah. look at. So, All right. Let's um, let's pause. There's a lot to think about here. Uh, let's pause and return to uh, a quicker discussion of Pfizer and starboard value and what developed, what interesting things developed there here at Shareholder Primacy. This is the Free Flow Media Podcast Network, where we cover the who of the business news because investing isn't a what, it's a who. Check out our other podcast, Business Pants, for fact based snark covering companies and executives. And The Proxy Countdown, the only podcast that treats company meetings like sporting events. Find them on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Back to the show. Welcome back to Shareholder Primacy. I'm Ann Lipton here with Mike Levin. And now we're going to talk about uh, Starboard's activist attack on Pfizer. What is going on there? Well, first... Um at some point, we got to stop talking about activist attacks. I know no. it's common, and I refer to it by something. You like that? Okay, great. Engagements. What was Engagement. it? Escalations. Escalation. We've got to lower the temperature. This is just a, But in this case, this was an attack. I will say that if you're Pfizer and you're Albert Borla, the CEO, you, you felt really attacked 
uh, by what happened in a very unusual way. So let me um, let me lay out some of the scenario. We can talk about that a little bit, though we don't know much uh, based on what's been disclosed so far. But it's worth it, it, we know enough to be able to bring up some very interesting issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's actually a little legal question we can we can kind of uh, bat around for a minute. So what happened was uh, just recently, um, in about the past week, um, it was disclosed that Starboard Value, the very famous Jeff Smith activist fund that was known for Darden and so forth and did some really great stuff there, most recently uh, had submitted this non-binding shareholder proposal we discussed at News Corp. Same guys. Mm -hmm. um, real badass fund. Uh, they um, have about a $1 billion investment in Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer, we all know and love, responsible for our COVID-19 vaccine and many other mm -hmm. miracle drugs. Um, and they uh, have some concerns that are um, not necessarily uh, been expressed yet. Starboard has not yet publicly stated any kind of a thesis or a case, though it's really clear share price is down uh, Pfizer took all of its uh, vast uh, profits from selling COVID-19 vaccines, invested in a bunch of M&A. Some worked out, some didn't. Uh, so it's not quite clear to like the investing public kind of exactly what, you know, how Pfizer should have handled this. And Starboard mm -hmm. evidently has some concerns, maybe even objections to how they've been running the business. Okay. So, um and, and we'll get to why this is distinctive in a minute, but let me let me cover a couple of the other quick f things that we do know. Um, so there's been no SEC filings from Starboard. They're not a 5% filer yet or ever. I don't think it, Pfizer's going to be way too big for them to hit 5%, I think. Um, so all we know is from, you know, news reporting and, and from evidently the way this got disclosed to Pfizer. Um, somebody, we think at Starboard, inadvertently sent an email to um, Pfizer, to the CEO, mm -hmm. to CEO Borla, copying the former CFO and CEO, the basically the CEO before Borla, uh -huh. uh, and um, also copying someone from Starboard. And it was a, I, I, evidently no one's, I haven't seen it, it was a blank email. All it was was a header. Uh, but um, the uh, CEO, and, Albert Borla, go these ahead. These former CEO, this, the former people, they're still on the board, right? They're still associated with No, them? they're, 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 they're uh, gone. They're, yeah, they're gone. Okay. They, they are, I don't believe uh, Ian, whatever his name is, is on mm -hmm. the board. CFO was never on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're still, they still own shares and so okay. forth, which yeah, will right. become important in a moment. Um, and so uh, they were um, copied on this. And uh, CEO Borla said, what is going on? And um, that's how it became clear that Starboard had its shares uh, and um, was clearly had something cooking. Um, the next thing that happened, there was a little bit of, of reporting, just news reporting, about how the CEO and CFO, in fact, were working with Starboard to try to help build their thesis, build their case, which is like gold. You know, I try to, you know, that's something I think about all the time is, can I get a former executive to help me with an activist situation? You know where the bodies are buried. Um, it was the basically the person who helped appoint Borla to his job. So so the, it, it's not surprising that Starbird had this relationship with these two two folks, okay? Um, There's a little bit of disclosure about how you were working together. And then what happened next was quite breathtaking and something of a left turn which is the two executives disavowed any relationship with Starbird and said, we are completely confidently mm -hmm. behind the incumbent board and so management. they completely are 100%, changed their Yes, they changed their tune. They said, y you know, yeah, maybe we talked to Starbird. We had like one call, but we don't disregard yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Okay. And so that was all in news reporting. All right. The, the one other thing that came out was Starboard wrote a letter to the board that 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 did get disclosed in a news release a couple days ago. And that letter said um, we were in touch with these two executives um, as part of our normal due diligence, which is totally uh, reasonable and, and totally expected. Uh, Starboard said we 
engaged them enough where they became interested in supporting us. Uh, we understand now, since this all kind of came out, this blank email thing, that they were threatened with litigation, with loss of their severance agreements, mm -hmm. with loss of uh, uh, shares and vesting and also anything that was in their, their golden parachutes, right. basically, was going to get taken away. Uh, and we urge the board to investigate this and to sort of see what happened. Okay, so that's that's kind of where it stands. Is that wow. the, the deal kind of blew up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Now it's it's because it's Starboard. It's hard to believe that this kind of thing is going to uh, compel Starboard to like just walk away. Right. The, 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 their their case, their thesis, their investment depends on more than just having these two executives. But this can't help. This probably hurts. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Not to mention just the embarrassment of this ridiculous. Oh, it's, it's, yes, it's like it's it's really silly for for them. Keystone it makes cops look kind of bad, <laughs> revelation. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, so that's kind of where it is. Uh, it's in my guess is they'll likely kind of continue it. It's not, they're supposed to have a meeting this coming week. Again, uh, mm -hmm. of course, this uh, podcast will be aired a little later, but uh, and so by the time it airs, we'll probably know what kind of meeting mm -hmm. they had, but there's supposed to be a meeting happening between uh, Starbird and uh, a couple and a board member and CEO Borla uh, that's upcoming. So that'll probably, you know, hopefully lead to something productive for these folks because there's hopefully something productive to be had here. Um, but other than that, like I said, there's not much known. But there, there's a couple distinctive aspects to this that are worth bringing out. The, the first is just how screwed up it was for this to happen the way it did and for two executives to be on board and mm -hmm. then to turn around. Uh, a, another interesting attribute of this was how it was, um, you know, this isn't some really horribly failing company. Share price is down and so forth, but it's generally a well-governed, well-regarded yeah. company. And and um, it, it's, it's, it's similar, I suppose, a little bit to like Disney or some of the others we've seen, where you have a really generally sound, you know, company with great products and so forth. And and we're looking for kind of incremental or, mm -hmm. or much more subtle changes. There's not, not really an obvious kind of... Uh, a set of arguments about what to do to turn around the share price. Okay. You know, Starbird clearly has its view, but um, doesn't necessarily, hasn't disclosed it yet, hasn't made anything public mm -hmm. uh, about what's what they think should be done. And, and I, that would be one of the next things I know I'd want to see. So, um, but wow. there, there's another interesting dimension to this that we, we should just take a moment to consider, which is the demands of the board from Starbird to like, investigate this now it's not clear who threatened right. the two executives whether that was at the board level or whether that was borla himself or some sort of well, minion. Borla, is borla borla's on the board though is himself. borla is yeah. definitely direct so that is that was, was the, if he threatened him he's doing it at the board level sure yeah yeah and he and he may have not disclosed this to the board i don't you know again yeah, we it, don't yeah. there's very little we know but what what's Based on what little we do know, and even littler that I've sort of talked about in the last few minutes, what's the what's the board's responsibilities here, and what kind of recourse might Starboard have? I, I'm sure it's not a whole lot, but I, well, I, I mean, kind of curious on your not, take. I mean, as a practical matter, I don't think a whole lot. I mean, like assuming nothing more happens other than, say, worst case scenario, a proxy contest. Yes. Then, um, you know, presumably there would have to be some disclosures about this, like because these guys were either. On Star Wars oh, side, they're not. And if there's going to be some kind of proxy contest where we're talking about where people stand, then there's going to have to be like what happened there. So I could totally see some kind of demand somewhere that this just be made public. Beyond that, I mean, the only legal rec like if we really got there, it would look something like Starbird suing. Um, the board for interference with a shareholder vote. I mean, that's really only that, like the only bucket, the only legal bucket in which I can put this is something like a takeover defense. So, so some sort of dis disenfranchisement or something. Exactly. Like and it's yeah. it's not really interfering with a shareholder vote. It doesn't prevent anyone from casting a ballot having accounting, but it does maybe interfere with Starbird's ability to make its case to shareholders. Yeah. So the bucket I would put it in maybe is something like a takeover defense. And we have you know, standards for takeover defenses. Sure. And the, you know, you can only, you know, and, and when you're interfering with a vote, which is the only thing this would be, you have to, for, you're only allowed to do that if you identify that there's a real threat 
to corporate policy, and it can't sure. simply be that shareholders are going to vote the wrong way. Right, or yeah, so, we're trying to displace a couple directors. Yeah, or, 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 well, yeah, it can't be something like we think they're going to vote the wrong way. So it's 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 so if. So if this is somehow trying to deny shareholders in information in some way, then that's the only kind of bucket I'd put it in. But it's not really like a traditional takeover defense that actually prevents the sure. contest from being run. So I don't even know if it would go in that bucket. You might ask what the base, like what exactly was the threat? I mean, like for all I know, there really was a provision in their severance agreement that says thou shalt not talk to invest, you know, like maybe they really did break a contract, (laughs) you know, and if that's the case, then like, you know, maybe there's really nothing that's simply other than, you know, disclosing what happened. So other, other than that, it sounds like it, it, from a probably legal and also I would submit from a tactical perspective Mm -hmm. for Pfizer, uh, probably not stupid of them to, Get in touch with these executives. Well, I mean, it depends on what kind of disclosures are forced out because, you know, like I can imagine Starbird or someone like you or someone else doing a books and records demand. Sure. So, you know, the internals of what exactly happened and what they got told could prove to be kind of embarrassing. Oh, the the optics, I'm confident the optics are going to make no party look good here. Yeah. (laughs) But in terms of uh, Smith's threat, Starbird's threat to, to, for an investigation or there's yeah, not I mean, much I'm, basis I'm just to, not sure, you know, try. although, you know, if the board stonewalls and it continues to look fishy, then, you know, that's going to go in the mix yeah. if they really do start throwing up takeover defenses um, or, you know, to interfere with a proxy contest or whatever else. If right. they start putting, you know, that'll go in the mix of this board was improperly motivated. It's under the, ca- you know, they're, they're captured by right. the CEO. So, so, so this, that, these two things might be evidence or the two, exa- the conduct uh, uh, threatening the two executives may be evidence of the board's intent. Yeah, but the, per se, the two the, the threats to the executives are probably not really really too actionable. It, 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 at best, it <laughs> may be evaluated as an impermissible takeover defense, but it's just yeah, so right. you know. At most, all it does is deny investors well, information, so it's hard to say. All right. Well, there's there's a lot more that's going to happen on this, so yeah. <laughs> right. so we we should, we could probably stay tuned. Yeah. And and monitor this one. How's that sound? Okay. Um, shall we uh, shall we shall we wrap up? We, all right. Had enough for today. Yep, sounds like we're done. All right, good. <laughs> it's been terrific talking about all this. This is Shareholder Primacy, hosted by Ann Lipton and me, Mike Levin. I'm an independent activist investor and advisor to investors about their activist situations. And Ann is, of course, the Michael M. Fleischman Professor in Business Law and Entrepreneurship at Tulane Law School and also an affiliate of Tulane's Murphy Institute. You can find me, Mike, at theactivistinvestor.com and Ann at law.tulane.edu. Our podcast is produced and distributed by Free Float Media. Thanks for listening, and we will see you all again very soon.